welcome to St Philip's and our Sunday morning service. My name is Catherine, I'm one of the members of the church. I'm going to be leading our service this morning. Rich, our vicar, he will be preaching a little bit later on. Wherever you're watching us from this morning or indeed any other point in the week that you might be catching up online, it's really good to have you with us and we hope that you enjoy our time of worship together. I wonder how you feel this week about going into another week of lockdown. If you're like me, this time is actually quite a challenging one, trying to balance a 15 month old toddler um, and a, a day job as such is really quite a challenge. And I think for many of us, it's perhaps overwhelming and challenging. Whether that list that you created of jobs to do has now been completed, the, the shed is painted, the fence is creosoted, the um, cakes are baked from the recipe book. Whether it's that you um, are trying to balance homeschooling and returning to that routine, whether you're missing the contact of people that you usually see, or whether your Easter egg chocolate is just finally at an end, and actually that in itself is a depressing thought. I guess wherever we're at, most people would say they're finding it a challenge. They would like to return to life as normal. And a bit later on today, we're going to hear the story of the road to Emmaus with some of Jesus' followers who I think would like to press the button to return to normal. I think they were feeling overwhelmed, uncertain, unsure, desperate for familiarity in the life that they had known. Not unlike us. And on our fridge, we have a magnet that says, life is not about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about learning to dance in the rain. As Christians, we're not protected from difficulty. Life will at times be overwhelming, difficult, we'll be longing to return to something a bit different from what we're experiencing. But what the followers in the story we hear about today learn, and what we absolutely can know, is that we are expected to dance in the rain, that we can dance in the rain, because in times of difficulty, God is with us. He does not leave us. We are not alone. And so it's in that message of hope and joy and resurrection that this morning we turn to our Father and in our thoughts and prayers and worship, we just reaffirm our faith in him. And so we're going to start this morning's worship by coming to him individually. And we're going to do that through the words of the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now Martin is going to lead us in worship. My wrestling Will leave 
lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. I won't fear what tomorrow brings. With each morning, I rise and sing. God's love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, my lighthouse. My Safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Far before us, you're the brightest.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. to Rich and Ben for adding some instruments there. If you were watching last week, you will have seen Rich interview a member of our congregation who works at the local hospital. One of the things that we're really keen to do as a church is to find out more uh, from our friends um, and family who are on the front line serving our communities. This week, Rich caught up with Dawn Stanford and um, found out more about her work at Nourish Food Bank and also in the area of domestic violence support. So Dawn, thanks so much um, for joining me for this um, chat. As, as you know, we're um, interviewing various members of our church family who are frontline workers and just trying to find out a little bit about what they do, about what difference um, the coronavirus pandemic has made to them. And I guess in the midst of that, what difference faith makes to them personally and also in their work. So um, we're aware that you work um, for Nourish, uh, Nourish Food Bank, and you're also uh, involved in supporting those who find themselves victims of domestic violence. So let's talk a little bit about Nourish um, to begin with. Tell, tell us a bit about Nourish, um, about its work just generally. Um, so Nourish is um, the food bank for the whole of Tunbridge Wells. We were set up about seven, nearly eight years ago now, and 90% um, of the parcels have been home delivered to people's doors. Um, referrals come in from different agencies that are working with people in crisis. So they're identified, um, referred to us for help, and then we can signpost them for extra help along the way. We're based down at Big Yellow Self Storage, and my office, as you know, is in the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Big Yellow donations come in, and that's where we deliver everything from. So we, um, yeah, we go, it's about 220 mile radius. Oh, wow. parts of South Tunbridge all the way out to Cranbrook and all the little hearsts and villages in between. Wow and what's your specific role within within that charity? Um, so I'm the operations manager so I yeah. run all of it I suppose. <laughs> There's a board of trustees above me that tell me what to do yeah. um, sort of once a month but other than that yeah it's me and then all my staff and volunteers around me. Okay and uh, we've, we've heard on the news um, you know, seeing pictures of food banks and food delivery of sort of distribution centres and that type of thing. Um, tell us what, what difference has, has the coronavirus outbreak made to, to nourish to yourself and to, and to the work that you and other food banks um, are, are doing? Um, so I think all food banks are finding it tough because 
demand has increased and donations have decreased at the same time. Um, so for us personally, on an average week, we used to deliver between 80 and 100 households a week. Um, just last week, we peaked, we thought we peaked at 229. Yesterday, we delivered 59 alone. Right. Um, that was in one day. And, it, and it's, um, you know, donations, we normally get um, group collections from churches, um, from clubs, from schools. Um, especially end of term and once a month collections and all those places are not meeting so those donations have dropped off we would normally get around two to three tons worth of food in a week and we've dropped down to two tons but demand wow. has obviously doubled so, um, and what, why is it that uh, what i mean some of the reasons might be obvious but what why is it that demand has increased so much um, it's a combination of um, nourish historically and our client base has really never um, hardly touched on the unworking it's mainly been working families something's cropped up and your wages just kind of cover your bills when everything's going okay when something happens that's unexpected they just don't stretch um, things you can prepare for in advance it's not so bad so look, we've had a big influx of people who are self-employed and who have had to make um, a claim for universal credit yeah. um, and you know it's taken them a few days to get through um, queue lines for the online service were about 100 to 150,000 people in a queue yeah. so if you are number 75,480 you were sitting against a computer screen for sort of six seven hours at a time yeah. then they were calling you back and that can be within the next 12 hours so people have been missed calls that have come through at two, three, four in the morning, and you know those staff are still working. But it and then when you get through and everything's processed, and there's another two or three days turnaround, it's five weeks to get any money. Yeah. If you've been working self-employed and you were getting money, um, or a zero hours contract, and um, suddenly you've got nothing. Yeah. Um, and for people who who are furloughed, you know, eighty percent of your wages for being at home and safe is lovely but 80% of your wages probably doesn't cover the outgoings of the household and you can't just cut them from one day to the next. And that's what people were like when they were suddenly furloughed. Sure. So yeah, we've had a, a big influx and, and quite a few vulnerable, um, not, not the ones necessarily that are in the shielded category, but certain pensioners that had other members of the family helping, um, disabled adults, people with learning difficulties, a lot with mental health, who were being supported before but now can't, those day centres, all those places that people used to have lunches, they're just not open. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, as always in my job, there's never a typical client really. <laughs> yeah. And um, so having heard that, uh, I mean, how might, um, how might we as a church support you? Are there practical things that we could do to support the work of Nourish at this time? So if, if you are going to a supermarket still for your essentials and you're not getting everything home delivered, obviously our boxes, our donation points are still in the supermarkets. So if you are able to pop an extra tin in or, or a packet of something, that would be hugely appreciated. The other thing we can do is if we're active on social media, you know, that's a massive forum for charities at the moment. Uh, share our posts, really. Yeah comment on them the algorithms don't work with likes they only work with comments um yeah. you know you you never know when you share a post how and who watches it sure. and it and it's it makes more connections than you actually realize and it takes yeah. a second yeah um, that's and, good and advice thank you yeah it, it's really really useful it's a yeah. lot people think that they can't do anything but actually that's that's amazing for me yeah. Um, and it does broaden our reach. Thank you. The other yeah. thing is, is pray, really. Yeah. I mean, pray for the clients, pray for them to seek help, for the ones that are worried, you know, for, for all of them, really. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dawn. The other thing I'd love to talk to you a bit about um, is, as I mentioned, is your, your work with those who find themselves victims of domestic violence. Uh, again, just like, you know, tragically, again, the news and the newspapers have brought to our attention that during the lockdown, there's been a, a rise in the cases of, of domestic violence. Is that, is that something that you personally have found in, in mm. your work? 
Um, yeah, for both really. Um, for Nourish, um, they're, the numbers for Nourish always are usually around 13% of our referrals are domestic violence um, as a reason anyway. Right. And in the deliveries, we've had a lot. I mean, we're doing, we're doing social distancing delivery, so we're, we're essentially playing a bit of knockdown ginger. We put the, the bags on the, on the um, doorstep, we knock and we walk away. But we've had, um, we've had a lot of um, re referrals for domestic violence where um, clients are not physically able because of, for whatever reason, um, to um, carry the bags. And so we've had to have a little bit more interaction with them. And that's, that's been more apparent than it is normally. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, obviously, domestic violence numbers have gone up um, but the ones seeking help have maybe gone down a little because those opportunities for people to have support are, are not there at the moment. So a lot yeah. of it is over the phone, but obviously that's not very easy if you live in a domestic violence environment. So yeah. that's been tricky. Um, so what I personally do is I'm a volunteer who works alongside DAVs and Choices and Assert, which are all domestic violence charities and the National Domestic Violence Women's Aid and the Women's Refuge. So I do two things. I rescue ladies who are here and need taking elsewhere um, and gentlemen. And I also pick up and help to resettle um, and act as a kind of mentor, ladies that are being resettled in this area. So having somebody at the end of the phone, chatting to them before they leave, when they leave and after they leave, you know, as, as um as kind of a crutch really to, to give them some support and have a friendly face that they know, you know, when they've been resettled in this area. Yeah. So um, a lot of it is on the phone. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's tricky and it, and it is, the volume is quite, um, it's quite emotionally draining. I have to say sure. it's, it's really hard and, it, and you invest a little bit of yourself in every single case. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, it is it is my personal passion it's it's um, a cause really close to me and i enjoy the work i do and it's lovely seeing these ladies when they're resettled and they're a few years down the line and you know out enjoying their life again and, and sort of with the whole sort of weight off their shoulders but yeah this process at the moment does seem to be very concentrated yeah if if um if, if we were had a particular concern either either for ourselves or for somebody that we knew what would be what's the best thing to do at the moment in this in this situation if we felt, so if we felt you, concerned for somebody who might be a victim yeah so if you're in contact with someone and they share with you information that leads you to believe that they're at risk um you can go through the um 101 non-emergency police line if there's an incident that you overhear or something happening um that you can hear from a neighbor or a property ring the police they have powers to um, proceed without consent, which means they do it for the safety of the person in the house. So they can remove the perpetrator, which is brilliant, and they can do that without somebody having to say, I want them taken. So that's, that's really positive. Um, the other thing is there, is there are two or three national lines, which you can Google, and obviously I'll give to you after, um, that you just ring. It's a national helpline. You you make the request and you also can pass it to somebody. It doesn't show up on a phone bill. It doesn't show up on a, a mobile phone bill. It's a free phone number um, and it's in its man 24 hours a day. Great. Okay, that's really helpful. So we'll put those um, that, that information up at the end of the service. There'll be a slide that will have those um, contact numbers and also the, the um, website for Nourish as well. Um, thanks so much um, for sharing. Just in a nutshell, I'm just mindful of time. Um, just two, two final questions. Firstly, um, you know, obviously you're, you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus. What difference does your faith make to you in the midst of this? And I guess just do you have any things that we can um, specifically pray for, both for yourself but also for the work that you're involved with? Um, I think my faith drives me as much as it comforts me um it is my passion and i've walked into these jobs at times when i've been praying for some sort of direction and the, these have opened up for me so i think it is where i'm meant to be and that very much is a faithful decision 
rather than a financial and monetary <laughs> successful decision. Um, but I, but I, um, I take great comfort from the fact that I am somebody with me, and I and I talk to God all all the time. I think He's probably sick of my voice. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm always talking to Him. I've talked to Him before, during, and after I've got off the phone with a client or whether I've been to an address, and um, and it it gives me great comfort. It really does, and yeah. it helps me on to the next one. Yeah. And how might we, are there things that we can be praying for, for Nourish or for your, or for the, your work with domestic violence victims? I think um, prayers that I don't <laughs> succumb to the COVID would be really, yeah. really welcome from yeah. the agencies that I work for as well as on a personal level. Um, and some days are really tough. Um, you know, I get home and I feel really heavy. So, um, yeah, just to... For some, you know, I know God takes the weight off me, um, but just increased strength, really. And for my clients, just to keep them safe yeah. and for them to remove those barriers for them seeking help. Um, yeah. I think that's the hardest thing for any of them is getting it. Yeah. Once they're with us, we've, we've got them, you know, yeah, but yeah. it's getting to me. Yeah. Dawn, thank you so much. Thanks so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. And, um, we will, we will be praying for you, for Nourish, for, your, for the, the work with domestic violence, and uh, we'll pray for it at the end um, or towards the end of the service as well. So thanks so much for joining me, uh, and uh, we will um, see you soon. Thanks, Rich. Take care. Thanks, Rich and Dawn. What amazing and vital work Dawn and her team do for people in our local community. We'll be praying for her and her team a little bit later on, but now we're going to continue with our service and I'm going to hand over to Daniel King, who is going to do our reading today, and then on to Rich, who's going to speak to us about that encounter on the road to Emmaus. On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death as, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the only one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter, then enter his glory? and begin with Moses and all the prophets. He explained to them what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he, he were going farther. But they, didn't, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has ris had risen, and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened that day and how Jesus was recognised by them and uh, when he broke the bread. 
I'm always amazed by the way that the story of the resurrection is followed by a number of stories that really highlight human frailty and deal with very real emotions and experiences that all of us go through. There's the story of Thomas and all of his doubt. There's the story of Peter who's failed, who's denied knowing Jesus and, and needs to be reinstated. And of course there's the story of the Emmaus Road that we're looking at today, the story of these two disciples who've been in Jerusalem, are journeying away from Jerusalem, their faces downcast, and they're filled with sadness and a sense of disappointment. All of us experience disappointment in life. We all know what that's like. Maybe in this season, uh, you're someone who's missed out on an event or a gathering that you are particularly looking forward to. Maybe uh, there's been a new baby born in your family that you've not been able to visit. Maybe you had a holiday booked that you were looking forward to and that holiday has been cancelled. Maybe uh, you're a fan of Liverpool Football Club. Uh, you've been wondering for years when you might get round to winning the Premier League. And then all of a sudden this season you amass a record number of points. You play some of the best football that the Premier League has ever seen. And towards the end of the season, when you're certain that you're going to win, the season gets suspended and you're left thinking, have we won it? Have we not won it? What's going to happen? We all face disappointments in life. Of course, some of those disappointments may be more trivial than others, but we all know what that's like. And I guess most of the time we, we just accept that that's how life is. We, we pick ourselves up, we brush ourselves down and we carry on. But I guess sometimes there can be a sense in which that disappointment hangs around. It begins to fester and it begins to become toxic in our lives. We actually begin to view life, if you like, through the prism of the disappointments that we've experienced and that affects the way that we see ourselves, it affects the way that we see others and of course sometimes it affects the way that we see God and the way that we relate to him. It can become something that damages our relationships and so I want today to think how do we process disappointment, how do we deal with disappointment in our lives, how do we acknowledge it recognise it as something that we all go through and how do we process it in a way that rather than damaging things actually leads to life and to wholeness and to health. The story of the Emmaus Road is the story of these disciples. They've been in Jerusalem uh, during what we call Holy Week. They've witnessed the events of Holy Week. They've witnessed Palm Sunday. They've seen Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey like a king. They've seen him cleanse the temple. They've seen him and heard him speak about the kingdom. And I guess at that point they, they're filled with hope and they're filled with anticipation. But Holy Week starts so promisingly and yet it tails off so quickly. Jesus is betrayed by a fellow disciple. Jesus is arrested. He's put on trial. He's crucified and he dies and is buried. There's a rumour that he's resurrected, but they haven't seen it. And so as they're walking away from Jerusalem, it feels as though all of their hopes, all of their excitement, all of their anticipation has just come crashing down around them. They don't know what to think, they don't know how to feel, and I guess they feel profoundly disappointed. It says that their faces were downcast. A downcast face is usually the consequence of a downcast heart. And as they're walking away, they use phrases like, but we had hoped. They had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah. They'd hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel and set Israel free from Roman occupation and establish the kingdom of God. But all of their hopes have come 
crashing down. The amazing thing about this story is that as they're walking away from Jerusalem, the risen Jesus draws alongside them. He actually begins to journey with them. And as he does that, he leads them in a process through their disappointment into a place of life and light and hope. How does he do that? Well, to begin with, Jesus encourages them to talk. He asks them about what they're talking about. He wants to hear their story. He wants to know what they're thinking. He wants to know what they're feeling. And I think often the first thing to help us deal with our own sense of disappointment when it comes along is just to be honest and to be real with God about how we feel and what we think. One of the things I, I love to do and, and find real comfort in is to turn to the Psalms. When I feel down or upset or whatever it might be, I love to turn to the Psalms and I love to read through the Psalms until I hear my own voice. As I read them, I'm, I'm looking out for that moment when the Psalmist is expressing what I'm feeling. And it's such a comfort to find that in the scripture, to hear our own voice in the words of the scriptures. And I guess as we find it, we linger there and we pray and we bring that feeling, that thought into the presence of God. All of the Psalms are legal prayers. And so we're able to linger upon those words, upon those feelings, upon those emotions and bring them honestly into the presence of God. It's such a help. And so firstly, Jesus asks them to speak, to share their story, to share their thoughts and their feelings. But of course, Jesus isn't just wanting to listen to them. He wants to speak into their situation as well. And so there comes a point where, where they finish speaking and then Jesus begins to speak to them. And it says that, that Jesus took them back into the scriptures. He starts with the law and the prophets. In other words, he takes them through the Old Testament. And as he does that, he begins to point out to them that actually the things that happened in Holy Week, they were the things that had been predicted and spoken about hundreds of years before. Actually, the Messiah had to experience and go through those things. That was part of the plan. It was part of the mission. It was part of what was foretold in the scriptures. And so Jesus begins to speak truth into their situation. And as he speaks truth, it, there's that sense in which their emotions and their feelings and their thoughts begin to come into line with what God has said is true and what God has said is going to happen. And it says that as Jesus spoke to them, their hearts burned within them. It's like as Jesus took them through the scriptures, their hearts were set on fire because they knew, even though they didn't yet recognise him, they knew that this stranger on the road with them was speaking truth, that this stranger on the road with them was sharing words that were light and bread and life to them. Jesus wants to hear our story, but he also wants to speak his truth into it. So as we listen for our voice in the scriptures, let's make sure we also listen for his. Eventually they come to Emmaus and the disciples welcome Jesus into the home and uh, they sit down and and they have a meal together. And as they have this meal together, Jesus takes bread and as he's sitting with them, he breaks it in front of them. And the Bible says that, that as that happened, they recognised him. As he broke bread in front of them, they recognised him for who he was, for who he is. I think the third thing 
is that it's often the case that we find the truth of who Jesus is, the truth of who God is, in our own story. Jesus took them back just a few days to that Maundy Thursday where he'd sat with them and he said, this is my body that's broken for you. He took them back to their own testimony. He took them back to something that they did know to be true. And as he did that, they recognised him for who he was. Psalm 77 is an amazing psalm to read when we feel down or when we have questions or we feel disappointed. The psalmist asks questions in that psalm which are not easy to answer. They're questions that don't have easy answers. And about halfway through, the psalmist says, actually, I'm not going to fix my attention on the questions that I can't answer. I'm going to fix my attention on what I know to be true, on the things that I know that God has done. And actually, as we journey back into our own story, we journey back to the cross, we journey back to the resurrection, we journey back to that moment or that process through which we came to faith. We journey back to those moments where we have seen God's activity in our lives, where, if you like, we've sat at the table with him and he's broken the bread in front of us. And it's in those moments, in, it's in our story, it's in our testimony that we recognise him for who he is, as the loving, faithful father that he always, always is. And so Jesus helps them to see the truth in his word and in his activity in their lives. My friends, all of us experience disappointments. All of us do that as we journey through life. We want to be real about it and we want to process them in a way that leads to life and to health. We want to find our voice in the words of the scriptures. We want to listen for his voice as he speaks truth into our situation. And we want to reflect on our own story of God's faithful activity in our lives. And as we do that, just like the disciples in this story, as they run back to Jerusalem and they find Peter and the other disciples and they say, it is true, he has risen. As we reflect on his truth and his activity in our lives, we find our lives filled again with his light, with his truth, with his peace and with faith and hope. Friends, let's pray together. Father, we recognise that, that all of us experience disappointments in life. And we want to thank you for this story, this very honest story about these two disciples who experienced just that. Father, we want to pray that you would help us to process disappointment in a way that actually leads to growth and life and health. Father, we pray that you would help us to find our own voice in the pages of the scriptures. Father, we pray that we'd ha you'd help us to hear your voice speaking truth and light into our situations. And Father, we thank you for our testimony. Our testimonies of your faithful interaction with us over the years. Lord, may they bring us to that place of life and peace and hope. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Rich. And having heard the story of that amazing encounter on the road to Emmaus, we're now going to um, encounter our Father for ourselves as we turn to a time of prayer. Let us pray. Father, at this difficult time, we see more clearly those things that we too easily take for granted. We thank you for the beauty of your world, for the sunshine, for beautiful countryside, for dog walks, for Zoom catch-ups with family and friends, for church services online, for phone chains and WhatsApp networks, for the outpouring of love through clapping shown on Thursday evenings, for those sewing scrubs, 
for those getting shopping and medicines for others, for those donating money to help the vulnerable, and for the general sense of community that continues to emerge. May we continue to value the small things in every day that come from you and to praise you in the challenging times in which we find ourselves. Father, we pray for all those on the front line, for NHS workers, care workers, teachers, charity workers, those providing a service in the community to supply food and keep key systems working to meet our basic needs. Protect them as they go about their work and we pray that they will feel a sense of their immense value to all of us at this time. We pray especially for the work of Dawn and Nourish. We thank you for the amazing support and resource this provides in our community. We pray for strength, energy and wisdom for Dawn as she leads this work. We pray for continued provision of all that is needed for this work to continue. And we also pray for those who are helped by it. May they find something of the love of you through the gifts, conversation and time that they receive. Father, we also pray for families and for protection over families at this time. We pray for those who find it hard to live together, for those who live alone away from family members, for those who worry about family members at work, for families where fun is being replaced by exhaustion and stress. Father, where there is anger and frustration, bring peace and reconciliation. Where there is worry, bring comfort. Where there is isolation, bring love. Where there is tiredness and stress, bring relief and refreshment. Finally, we pray for world leaders and advisors as they lead their people through this time. Give them wisdom, discernment, courage and clarity as they make decisions for the best of their countries. Father, we thank you that in all that happens to us, you do not abandon us, that in your resurrection is the hope that you walk with us every day of our lives, that even when storms come, you will not let them consume us and that we can turn to you, our faithful friend and redeemer. Amen. So unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace, Lord of all. I to you again and again I call out to you again and again
girl up to you again and again. I call up to you again and again. You are my together this morning. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed your time of worship with us. Um, just a final thought going out into the week. I wonder if any of you have seen the story in the news that I saw last week of the gentleman who was uh, reaching his 100th birthday and he set himself the challenge that by the time he was 100 he wanted to have done 100 laps of his garden. And the challenge he set himself was to raise a thousand pounds for charity. Um, as he nears his 100th birthday at the end of this week, so the Friday that actually has just passed, um, not only has he achieved his £1,000 target, but he's also um, managed to get £27 million, way beyond what he ever had hoped for. And in addition to that, he has um, achieved a top spot, top of the charts, having recorded a single with uh, Michael Ball. I don't doubt that when he started out a couple of weeks ago with his challenge and his dream that he would ever have conceived that he could have achieved £27 million for charity and a number one single with a celebrity. He would never have dreamed such a thing was possible. And yet as we go out into what will well be another challenging week, we remember that we walk with a God who has plans for us that are also beyond our wildest dreams and that in that resurrection story that we've been hearing about over the last few weeks we can hope of a faithfulness and a love that is beyond anything that we could possibly imagine to create in our own strength. What an amazing message, what an amazing sense um, of rejoicing we can go out with into the week ahead knowing that to be true. And so as we come to the end this morning and we go out rejoicing in that message of glory, we say the blessing. May the Lord bless us and protect us. May the Lord smile on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord show us his favour and give us his peace. <laughs>